Hey everyone, I'm back with a mini tutorial just to cover a couple of things that I missed in the previous video that have been requested. The first thing is to make sure that the start button actually loads into the main game view. Um, so right now the only thing my start button does is plays a plays an effect which I had set up in my scene previously. Um, so this is an effect that plays. So when I hit the start button, it triggers this particle effect and sound effect. Now, um, one of the things that I um, didn't show previously is that if you have a button that triggers a sound effect, but that button is on a menu that disappears, that can cause the sound effect to get cut off. And so this this way that I have have it set up, having a having an object that um, triggers the sound effect. Uh, is one of the solutions. I am going to show a different solution, but this solution, um, oh, it's not prefabs, it is resources. Um, this solution it spawns this effect object, which has both a particle system and a sound effect. And so this sound effect is not actually attached to the button. From the options menu, I have um, a button that plays a sound effect, and the sound effect is actually attached to the button for that case. Um, so if this options menu were disappearing, it would cut off the sound effect for that button. So um, I'm going to show a different solution for how to play a sound effect on a menu that disappears. Um, but for my start start menu, uh, my start button, it um, plays an effect, uh, a sound effect and a particle effect that is separate from the button itself. And I want the button, in addition to doing this effect, I want it to also load the next scene. So I need to make a script that will handle that happening. So I'm going to make a new script called um, called uh, start transition. And this is going to control uh, control loading into the next scene. It is also going to control uh, a loading bar so that um, it w what will happen is if I tried to load the next scene immediately, it would cut off the sound effect that I'm playing. Even though it's not attached to the start button, it would cut off that sound effect because it exists in this scene. And it, as I'm loading the next scene, um, it would stop playing any sound effects that exist only in this scene. So I'm going to open up that C Sharp script and then I'll also need to make an object in my scene that I will attach this script to. So here's my new script, start uh, start transition. And um, what I want to do is, um, I'm actually going to have everything uh, just using the start button and the update button. And rather than um, having the button call a function, which is how we, we did it previously for um, what is currently happening with the start button. So it is calling a specific function. Rather than having it call a specific function, I'm actually going to have the start button turn on the game object that this script will be attached to. And then uh, that will cause the start function to play and the update function to play. And so I can put all of my code in start and update and those won't start happening until uh, until I press the button and cause the game object to come into existence. So just to make that a little more clear, I'm going to set up the game object first. So I'm going to create a new game object. Uh, I am going to make it a UI object. I'm actually going to make it a panel because uh, part of this effect, I'm actually going to have the screen turn black and then put a loading bar on the screen that fills up while, I, uh, while I'm running a timer before I load the next scene. So this will be called start transition. I'm naming my game object so I can find it easily. And I'm going to attach my script to that. And I can see it showed up over here in the inspector. And now I'm going to select my start button again. And on the on click area, I'm going to hit plus to make a second on click event. 
I'm going to drag that start transition into the slot here. And then under no function, I'm going to choose game object, set active, and check the box. Now I'm going to select my start transition and uncheck this box so it is turned off. And now I can actually test this in just to make sure that it is actually activating that object. So now when I hit the start button, it is activating this start transition. And so that means that once this object is active, it will run its start function and then also its update function. The start function will run once on the frame that it first exists and the update function will run every frame uh, as soon as it, uh, it, as soon as it is, is turned on. So neither of these will play until I turn the object on um, and the start uh, function will play once and then the update function will play continuously. So in my script, I'm going to create a, a, a timer that will run in the update function and after one second, it will load the next scene. So I'm going to go up to the top of my script right after, er, yes, right after the first curly bracket and right before the start function. And I'm going to make a private float variable called my timer. Um, we want to be careful not to use uh, any names for things that might be used by Unity for other things. Um, so I'm not sure if timer is already used, so I don't want to risk um, naming this something that is already in use. Uh, similarly, when I used start transition, I didn't want to use just the word start because start is already a keyword for the function start here. So it's important to um, name your variables and scripts things that are not already being used by Unity for other functionality. So uh, my start timer, I'm going to start it equal to one. And then in my update function, I'm going to do my timer minus equals and then time dot delta time. What this is, is time dot delta time is uh, a very, very small fraction. It is the amount of time since the last frame. And so what that means is um, if your game is running at 60 frames per second, uh, the amount of time since the last frame is about 1 60th of a second. But this variable actually, or this, um, this uh, time dot delta time actually changes based on how long it took for the previous frame to load. So uh, it, this actually keeps accurate track of how much time has passed. So you can use this as a way to keep track of time as it is passing. This is also a way to prevent things from being dependent on frame rate. So you can use time.delta time when applying to movement or to transitions of things uh, to make sure that it runs the same regardless of the frame rate that the user has on their computer. So this makes it so that things will look and function basically the same even at uh, even on computers that run at a lower frame rate. So once this timer gets to zero. I'm going to say less than or equal to zero because time dot ta delta time is a, a variable amount. It changes every frame. We don't know if it's going to hit exactly zero. It is possible it will never hit exactly zero, but eventually it will definitely be less than zero. So I'm going to check if it is less than or equal to zero. And if it is, I'm going to load the next scene. Uh, to load scenes in Unity, we do have to add up at the top of the script using Unity Engine dot scene management. And then in this if statement, I can do scene manager dot load scene. And here's where I would put the uh, name or number of the scene that I want to load. And I'm going to use um, I'm going to use one because I'm going to make my start screen the first screen and then I'm going to make my main game the second screen. Uh, however, the scene index starts at zero. So that actually means that the start screen will be scene zero and the main game will be scene one. So I want to make sure to end that with a semicolon and save my script. And then go back to my scene. And I'm going to um, I'm going to just test to make sure that works first, and then I'm going to make some uh, visual effects like having this object fade in, and then having a, a loading bar fill up. 
So just to make sure that the transition itself works. So it actually reloaded the same scene and that's because I haven't set up my build settings yet. So um, let me show you how to do that. If you go to file and build settings, I can see sample scene uh, is scene zero and I'm not even using sample scene. The scene that I'm in right now is called start screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add open scene and I'm going to delete sample scene. I'm not using that one. And then um, let me open up my scenes folder and I'm gonna drag in the game view scene. So I'm gonna drag this in. And over here on the right hand side, you can see the build index number. So um, start screen, it has index zero and then game view has index one. So this one here corresponds to this one in my load scene. So whatever number I put here, it is going to look in the build settings and attempt to load that scene. Let me save this scene and then try that out one more time. All right, so after one second, it loads into the main game view. Now, just so I can show what I meant about the sound effect cutting off, if I made this uh, timer zero, then um, it'll it'll uh, actually automatically just go straight to loading the scene because the very first frame, it will be less than zero. So um, I just wanna show what happens where uh, you won't be able to hear the, the sound, or if you do, it'll get cut off pretty quickly. Yeah, so you actually it might have heard it started just a tiny bit, um, but was not able to finish. So I'm going to set this back to 1, and if your sound effect is a little bit longer, you might even set this longer than 1, maybe 1 1.5 or 2. Uh, but I think 1 is long enough for the sound effect that I have chosen. Uh, and so now I'm going to set up an animation that goes with that. So um, that's it for the scripting part of this um, to get the start button to work. So the only thing I need to do now is to actually um, animate the, uh, the transition and a loading bar. So let me turn this on just so I can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to make this black. And um, what I actually want to do is I'm going to animate over the alpha here. So I'm going to start with alpha is zero and I'm going to animate it to alpha is one. Uh, I am just going to leave it fully black right now just while I set up my loading bar. So I'm going to create a UI and a slider. And I could make this a little bit larger. Now with sliders, um, we've, we've run into this before in, this, uh, in previous videos in this series of not ne wanting to not scale. Uh, our UI elements because of uh, issues with distortion that happens and also issues with um, Unity not being able to scale things properly. So you can adjust the width and height of the slider. So I can make it taller like this. Um, I'm going to also remove the handle because I don't want the handle to be visible. So I'm just going to select under handle slide area. I'm going to select the handle and turn that off. And we can uh, drag the value here just to see what that looks like filling up. Last time I turned off the uh, handle, I also adjusted so that there's no gap here. And so that is under the fill area. Um, selecting the fill area and setting the right to five so that it fills all the way up. And I also want to set my fill color. I'm going to use green. And I want to make sure that this object is centered right in the middle of my screen. So I'm going to set the X and Y position to zero. I might make this a little bit wider also. So I'm going to do 180. Let's try um, 300. Okay. So this will be my loading bar. And this is what it will look like when it fills up. Uh, and I probably want some text up here to say loading. So I'm going to also go to game object. UI text and say loading and um, I could either um, put this text above the loading bar or I actually might even just put it on the loading bar itself so it'll fill up like this I think that looks pretty nice 
Um, I probably want to make the text just a little bit darker though so that it shows up okay on the green background. Okay, so that'll be the animation that plays. Um, so let me take this slider and this text and make them both a child of the start transition panel. I want all of this to be connected together. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an animation on the start transition. Uh, now that I have set up my slider, I'm going to go ahead and set the alpha back to zero for this. And I'm going to go to my animation folder, create a new animation called loading. And I'm going to attach this to this start transition object. And it creates an animator controller for us. Um, and I'm not going to uh, modify the animator controller this time like we have in the previous times. I actually want this animation to play right away as soon as this object is turned on. So I'm just going to let it play automatically. And I'm going to go to my animation window and I'm going to add some properties. The first one is the image and color, which is the this color here on the panel. So I can adjust the alpha. And um, I probably want this to be... A, faster than one second. This one marker over here is one second. And um, I know that my entire transition lasts one second, so I want it to be uh, fully blacked out before then. So I want to adjust the alpha here. So I'm going to delete this last keyframe here and set my alpha to one. And so that is what that transition will look like. And then I'm going to add another property. And under slider, I am going to um, open up the slider option here. Um, and so I'm inside of slider and then slider again. And then down near the bottom is one for value. And this lets you actually adjust the value of the slider on here. So I'm going to, uh, for this one, I actually, I'm going to delete this keyframe here. I actually do want this one to take the full one second so that it aligns with how long it takes the the entire transition to take. So I'm going to set this value to one. And so now we can see that effect happening. Um, if you didn't want the loading bar to be on the screen right at the start, um, the other thing that we could do is we could add property uh, for slider is active. Um, so to make this easier, I'm just going to take the text here and make it a child of the slider. And um, I'm going to uncheck the box for this slider. And I'm going to do um, under the slider, I'm going to add property for is active. Um, and it starts not active. And I'm going to make it active right about here. Um, and I'm going to adjust the the starting keyframe for my slider value of zero. I'm going to drag this over so that when I turn the object on, that is when it starts at zero. So that is how that whole transition plays out. Um, so now let's um, let's test this. Uh, so I'm going to select my start transition object and I'm going to uncheck the box for it in my scene so that it is turned off. Uh, and then my um, start button should turn this on, automatically play the animation, and then load the next scene after one second. And I'm going to go ahead and save my scene right now. And um, the particle effect kind of covered some of that up. So I think I am going to um, uh, adjust that particle effect to um, actually, maybe I'll just disable the particle effect so we can see the full transition. So under my resources, I'm going to um, select this effect and um, maybe this particle effect, uh, I'll just go ahead and remove this component. So I'm right clicking on the word particle system and I'm going to choose remove component. And so now there's not going to be a particle system that plays. So now we should be able to see the full loading transition better. 
And if you wanted to see it a little bit longer, you could increase this value, maybe 1.5. If you make this a decimal, you do have to add the letter F to the end of it because this is a float. Um, and to let Unity know that you want to convert a decimal point to a floating point, you have to put the F at the end. So I'll save that change. And we'll just test one more time. And since I uh, adjusted the um, length of time for the timer, I would also want to adjust the animation so that this last keyframe happens at uh, one thirty. So that would be one and a half seconds um, so that it would actually align with the um, timer. Uh, and so one more thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go to my game view scene and I have my options menu in here and currently I don't have a way to turn this on so I'm gonna add to my hotkeys script um, a, uh, a button to pop up the options menu uh, and then I'm gonna show the other the other option for making sure that your buttons play sound effects even when the object is disabled so I'm going to in my update function this is where I have all of my hotkeys I'm gonna add a new one uh, right after my uh, key code dot space. So after this one, I'm going to do if input dot get key down key code dot escape. So when the user presses the escape key, I'm going to turn on the uh, pop-up options menu. So to do that, I need to make a public game object that I can turn on. So I'll do public game object pop-up menu. And then in my if statement, I will do pop-up menu dot set active, and then uh, in parentheses, I just put the word true, and then end that with a semicolon. And so this will um, enable the pop-up menu when I press the escape key. And so I can save that. And then I need to remember to give the hotkeys uh, object a reference to that pop-up, which is my options menu in the canvas. And now, when I hit play. Now when I press escape, it turns this on. Uh, and then what I want to do is, uh, when I hit escape, uh, accept, I want this to go away. And you hear my accept uh, plays a sound effect. This sound effect is attached to the button. So when I do this, it will cut that sound effect off and I will show how to fix that. So on my options menu, on my accept button, here's my sound effect that plays, and I'm going to hit plus in here so I can turn the options menu back off. So I'm going to drag the options menu into this slot, and from no function, choose game object, set active, and leave this unchecked. So now when I hit the accept button, it will close the options menu. So I hit escape, and it pops up the options menu, and then I hit accept. And now the sound effect didn't play because it turned the object off that had the, um, the button is a child of it and the sound effect is attached to the button. So to fix this, I'm going to locate my sound effect, which is this one here. I'm going to make a new empty game object in my scene called button sounds. And then I'm going to add a component here for audio source. I already forgot which one was my button sound effect, so let me just highlight it again. Okay, so this one here is the sound effect. Uh, so I'm going to select my button sounds and drag this into the audio clip slot. Uncheck the box for play on awake. I don't want this to play automatically. And then back on my accept button. So here's where I'm attempting to play the sound effect that's attached to the accept button. So I'm going to select this line here and I'm going to replace the, um, the button 
sound effect, I'm going to replace it with this object, button sounds. And then from no function, I'm going to choose audio source and play. So now instead of playing the audio source on the button itself, I'm going to play the audio source on the button sounds. And this object does not disappear, so that means it will be able to play even when the object is disabled. So uh, let's try that again. And so now my sound effect plays properly. Uh, and so let me save that scene and we'll go back to the start screen and we'll test the whole thing all put together. All right. So now uh, my start button uh, plays a loading effect uh, at, with a timer so that it allow, allows the effect and the sound to play all the way through before loading the next scene. And then in my main game view, I have the ability to turn on my uh, options pop up and then the accept button plays a sound effect even when the object is disabled. So hopefully that helps fix a few of the things that people ran into when following my previous tutorial uh, and adds a little bit of extra flavor to your entire UI experience. Thanks for watching.